This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On June the 21st, the Museum and the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association co-hosted a special evening honoring the Canadian nurses who were in the Battle of Hong Kong in 1941 and who subsequently spent nearly two years in Japanese captivity. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mike Babin, and I'm the president of the HKVCA, the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association. I'm very proud to be the son of a Hong Kong veteran, Alfred Babin, of the Royal Rifles of Canada. Tonight, we're very pleased to partner with the Royal Canadian Military Institute to present the fourth in our series of virtual events. I hope we've been successful so far in bringing you interesting speakers and topics that highlight aspects of the Battle of Hong Kong that you may not be familiar with. Now to tonight's program. We are delighted to be partnering with the Royal Canadian Military Institute, and I welcome its many members who are attending this evening. The RCMI, located in Toronto, is one of Canada's foremost institutions for the study and discussion of military history, defence, security, and international affairs and it maintains an extensive collection of artifacts and documents in its museum, library, and archives. We'll start our program this evening with a tour of the RCMI by its curator, Ryan Goldsworthy. One of the RCMI's many excellent exhibits is about Lieutenant Kay Christie, a Canadian nursing sister who served with Seaforce. The RCMI's curator, Emeritus Gregory Loughton, will speak about Kay and her nursing colleague, Anna Mae Waters. And finally, one of Kay's nephews, Bruce Christie, will speak of his personal recollections of Kay. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. First, I'm very pleased to introduce Ryan Goldsworthy. Ryan is the museum director and curator of the, uh, at the Royal Canadian Military Institute, where he manages the Institute's extensive museum collection, curates its exhibitions, and maintains many collaborations and partnerships with other museums and institutions. At the RCMI, he has amassed the most diverse and complete collection of Canadian First World War uniforms in existence. Ryan was formerly an educator and a First World War historian at the Military Museums of Calgary. He's been published in various journals, including the Canadian Military Journal and the RCMI's own journal, CITRA. He currently serves on the board at the Lawrence Cox Regimental Museum and on the Museum Committee of the Second Intelligence Company. Our second speaker will be Gregory Loughton. With museum work experience with Stevenson and Richmond uh, Municipal Steveson, uh, Steveston, pardon me, and Richmond Municipal Museums and the BC Regiment Museum, Gregory joined the RCMI Museum as curator in November of 1985. He built a modern accessions, re accessions register, added more Canadian content to the collection, supervised the closing and the hibernation of the RCMI's museum, during the building of the new RCMI from 2010 to 2014, and assisted in planning and building the exhibits uh, in the RCMI's new facility. He retired in fall of 2016 and is still actively involved as curator emeritus and museum advisor. Our third speaker is Bruce Christie. Bruce is a nephew of Lieutenant Kay Christie. He and his wife, Diane, reside in Mississauga, Ontario, he retired 20 years ago following a 40-year career in agribusiness. Bruce is the oldest of Kay's nephews and nieces, all of whom benefited from their Aunt Kay's friendship and encouraging support for their various endeavors. Bruce will be happy to share some family memories, which will hopefully serve to personalize the impressive military legacy of nursing sister Kay Christie. So we'll begin our presentation this evening with a tour of the Royal Canadian Military Museum given by Ryan Goldsberg. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike, for that kind introduction. And let me just speak on behalf of the RCMI when I say we've been happy and honored to work with the organization and this collaboration. Uh, I think it's been a long time coming given your status and ours as it relates to the Battle of Hong Kong. So we're very happy to do this tonight. And we have a very diverse and international audience that we're happy to reach this evening. So welcome to everyone. Of course, I'm also joined here by my captain and my other ranks, uh, Second World War uniforms, so they'll be backing me up in my speech this evening. 
So as the director and the curator of the RCMI, uh, this will be my pleasure to give this talk to our great audience today. Uh, it's a privilege to speak to members and guests of the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, and as always, those individuals from the RCMI. Uh, I'd like to say welcome to everyone, regardless of your affiliation with the RCMI or the HKVCA, and thank you for attending and for participating today. It's events such as these and the material history preserved at the RCMI, which will continue to help maintain our history now and for future generations. So just as a quick outline before I get going here, uh, I'll just be speaking for about 20 minutes. And in this time, I'm gonna provide a very brief history of the RCMI. I'll offer a short virtual tour of our museum and some of its masterpieces. And I'll finish with an overview of our museum collection as it relates to the Battle of Hong Kong, specifically the metal sets of J.K. Lawson, George MacDonnell, and K. Christie. So as for the RCMI, uh, for those who are familiar and unfamiliar with us, it's an astonishing and hidden gem in downtown Toronto at University and Dundas Avenue. Uh, the RCMI has an iconic facade with its stone pillars and two nine-pounder War of 1812 cannons out front, as you can see on the photo on the left. It's a genuine Victorian institution and it's a unique academic forum in Canada. So the RCMI was actually founded all the way back on January 30th, 1890 uh, by a group of 50 Canadian militia officers headed by General William Otter he was actually a distinguished veteran of the Fenian raids, the Northwest Rebellion, and even the Boer War. So he was really one of Canada's leading military figures at the time. Uh, you can see his portrait there on the left, which was painted by war artist Trudy Kearns. So the CMI, as it was known in those early days, we hadn't quite earned the royal designation until later, uh, was founded with the Governor General as its patron, then Lord Frederick Stanley, probably best remembered by most of us, uh, for presenting Canada with the Stanley Cup. Uh, but of course, the continued patronage of the Governor General is a tradition that we maintain to this day. Uh, and this actually includes the only complete Governor General portrait gallery outside of Rideau Hall in Ottawa. Um, so a couple more points. In 1907, uh, then the CMI acquired the back of its current premises on Simcoe Street, which is sort of the back half of the building you're looking at on the slide. And this followed in 1912, five years later, by the acquisition of the front and its more iconic premises on University Avenue. So in those early days and up until just after World War II, uh, membership at the CMI was restricted to army officers only. I might describe the intention of the Institute in that early time as a classier legion hall. So following World War II and the influx of hundreds of thousands of new veterans to Canada, all Canadian military officers were permitted to join the Institute. And shortly thereafter in 1948, the CMI received its royal designation from King George VI, of course, the father of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, membership re restrictions slowly eased after that time and especially through the efforts of trailblazers, which included Kate Christie, more on that later. Today, of course, anyone can join the RCMI regardless of military service or affiliations. So the old RCMI was demolished in 2010. Uh, the air rights were sold to a condominium developer. And after a four year redevelopment period, the new RCMI opened in 2014 on the same location that it was in 1912. So great history. Um, but let's move into the museum itself. So the museum of the RCMI is nearly as old as the Institute itself. Uh, we've been collecting and maintaining artifacts since 1907. Uh, the museum is actually the largest military history museum in Toronto and one of the largest in Canada with over 12,000 artifacts and archival materials in our collection. Uh, the museum actually has six floors of display space and galleries within the Institute. And we possess one of the most exceptional without hyperbole and complete collections of firearms from 1855 to the present, uniforms and metal sets in the world. Uh, so seen here, we actually have a boy's anti-tank rifle, which is actually the largest bolt action rifle uh, of the Second World War. 
Uh, in the middle, we have our two iconic nine pounder cannons, which are dated to 1815. And on the end, we actually have a solid gold 22 karat commemorative coin to the 50th anniversary of the Queen's Own Rifles in 1910. It's the only one I think is in existence. Uh, for all of my Queen's Own friends on the call, you'll probably notice Colonel Sir Henry Pallat, the founder of Castle Loma, and Lieutenant Colonel Dury, who was the first uh, CEO of the regiment. Um, our collection, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention this, is actually very diverse and includes the most complete collection of Canadian First World War uniforms and militaria in existence. So in recent years, the museum has acquired dozens of complete and exquisite Canadian uniforms named many different battalions and support corps of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. The majority of these uniforms were originally of the J. Victor Tabouke collection, a collection which was amassed over 30 years. So the museum is actually planning to unveil its permanent First World War gallery at the RCMI later this year. And this gallery will feature a number of our uniforms and other rare and exciting artifacts. So seen here very quick, we actually have a Lieutenant's 18th Battalion service dress jacket and cap, very great condition. Uh, in the middle, we actually have a private stretcher bearers 85th Battalion jacket with an armband, extremely rare. This will actually form part of our exhibition later this year. And finally, on the end, we have a Corporal's 5th Battalion service dress jacket and cap with the blue epaulets, if you may notice in the small photo. It's extremely rare because those blue epaulets, for those who know, uh, means that this individual was within the first contingent of Canadians who went overseas to fight in France in 1915. So three of our rarest uniforms and one of the best collections you'll ever see. So now I'll move on to a short virtual tour of the RCMI. Um, of course, with our six floors of display, I'm only gonna feature some of the highlights. And of course, I'd encourage anyone interested to join us for a guided tour once we've formally reopened later this year. Um, so on the left here, we actually have our library, which is very acclaimed. It's actually the largest private library of military history in Canada. It's an amazing resource for research, researchers, academics, scholars, and members. Uh, it's highly acclaimed with you know, the ladders moving across, the floor to ceiling bookcases. It's something to behold, and it really captures the essence of the old institute. And on the right there as well, I have featured a display we uh, installed for the centenary of the end of the, sec or the First World War, uh, which commemorates Canada's 100 days, which is probably Canada's most impactful achievement of the First World War, and what uh, Jack Granitstein called the most important Canadian role in battle ever, the only time that this nation's military contribution might be truly called decisive. Uh, so outside of the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, I would say that the RCMI maintains one of the largest war art portfolios in Canada. Uh, we have signed Arthur Lismer prints. We have 19th century portraits of the Duke of Wellington and General Napoleon. We have a portrait of Lieutenant Ray by Dame Laura Knight, which was commissioned in 1917 during the First World War. It's an amazing piece. And the two paintings you see here, uh, these are originals which were painted by Trudy Kearns, a war artist, and they were commissioned by Catherine Langley Hope for the bicentennial of the War of 1812. So these astonishing and striking portraits are each over six feet tall. And today, of course, is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And in honor of that, I'd like to draw your attention to a purposeful detail of these portraits. So we can see that Brock and Tecumseh are holding each other's weapons, Tecumseh with the musket, Brock with the War Club, which signifies the trust, the cooperation, and the respect between these two great military leaders and Canada's past. So one quick exhibition I wanted to share here, because it's very special and not one that you'll see in many other museums, uh, is actually a collaboration we did with CSIS a couple of years ago, honoring the 80th anniversary of the Special Operations Executive Act and winning the Second World War. Um, so of the amazing artifacts we have in here, some of which are one of a kind, is the disc cutter on the far left there of Sir William Stevenson. Many of you probably recognize the name. Stevenson, of course, was the head of the British security coordination during the Second World War. The man called Intrepid, arguably the, um, the basis of Ian Fleming's James Bond. 
and of course, a proud Canadian in himself. So this artifact in the corner there, the disc cutter, had actually recorded and cut conversations in real time that he was having in his office, even with individuals such as FDR and Churchill. And it actually still works, the old general motor uh, inside, uh, excuse me, the general electric motor inside still actually operates. So it's an amazing uh, piece. So the last exhibition I'm actually gonna feature uh, before I discuss some of our masterpieces is our Canadian Women at War exhibition, which is uh, titled 120 Years of Dedicated Service. So this was actually unveiled by the Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell in 2019. So in recent years uh, at the RCMI, we've made greater strides to better represent, honor and commemorate the role of women in Canada's armed forces through the past 120 years. So the artifacts in this exhibition range from the Boer War through to the war in Afghanistan. And given this evening's topic of nursing sisters in the Battle of Hong Kong, I thought it would be appropriate to highlight our objects named a nursing sister, Laura Mullen Robinson of the First World War. So of the large collection we acquired in 2018, on display we have Robinson's dress uniform, jacket, her cape, and her original leather boots as you see there. So this image here, as small as it is, it actually helps us to understand the evolution of the type of uniform worn by Kay Christie and by A. Anna Mae Waters, which we'll see a little bit later. So this brings us to the masterpieces of the RCMI collection in which I'll discuss just three of them before I move on to our Hong Kong metal sets. So this first uh, masterpiece is perhaps the most acclaimed of our collection and it always astounds individuals who realize that this is at uh, the RCMI in downtown Toronto, which is of course the cockpit seat of the Red Baron, which he was shot down and killed in, um, in April 29th, 1918. So how did this amazing artifact come to be at the RCMI? Well, it actually has a Canadian connection to all of it. So the pilot who is officially credited with uh, shooting down the Red Baron, Captain Roy Brown, uh, was able to bring home several of the war trophies from the wreck of the Red Baron's Fokker triplane, one of which was the cockpit seat that you see here. And of the original photos that we have, it's actually more or less in the same condition as it was when they tore it out of the cockpit in 1918. So from that same collection, we actually have a strip of the fuselage where basically it's made of canvas. So these, you know, these early aircraft were you know, basically skeletons covered in canvas. So this actually was stripped right off the side of the Red Baron's aircraft. And it has the iconic red paint where you got the moniker of the Red Baron. It's an amazing piece. And right in the center of the fabric, we actually have all of the signatures of Roy Brown's squadron, the 209 squadron of the then newly formed Royal Air Force. So all of these men actually signed this and delivered the piece of uh, fabric to Roy while he was recovering in the hospital. So it's essentially a large get well card, which is amazing. And it, it preserves all of the names of his squadron at the time. And at the top left column, I'm not sure if you can see it, but we actually have Wap May's uh, name on there as well. So another uh, claimed Canadian pilot in our history. So fabulous piece. Uh, the second of our three masterpieces, uh, this is from the Roy Brown collection. So that was my segue into him specifically. So this is actually a piece of a propeller from his Sopwith triplane that he sent home in 1917, and it was intended as a frame as you see it here. So this piece was actually donated by Roy's granddaughter for the centennial of the Red Baron's um, defeat in 2018. So this hung in the Brown home for about 100 years. And we actually have, here it is again, we actually have the original letter from Roy, which he addressed to his father because he sent this home as a package while he was still at the front. And he said to his father, I'm going to send you a piece of propeller with a photograph mounted in it. It is off the original triplane, which is the fastest machine we have. So all of this is original minus the frame in the middle, which was had been degraded. So the photograph and this propeller, all original, it's a beautiful piece. The last of the three masterpieces, which I want to feature for tonight's event, is the metal set of Major Frederick Tilston. So the RCMI is fortunate enough to possess one of, 16, one of the 16 Canadian World War II Victoria Crosses, this belonging to Major Frederick Tilston. 
who was a Toronto native and a long loyal time loyal member of the RCMI. So Tilson actually served in the Essex Scottish Regiment in the Second World War, and he won this right near the end in March of 1945. So the London Gazette actually wrote on Tilson's actions in 1945, just to give you a sense of how amazing this achievement was. By his calm courage, gallant conduct, and total disregard for his own safety, he fired his men with grim determination and their firm stand enabled the regiment to accomplish its object. So as a, as a result of the wounds that Tilson sustained, he actually lost both of his legs and one of his eyes in the action, but he did survive the war and he passed away in 1992. So one other piece really quickly that actually is associated with Tilston is his cap badge and his collar badges. So it's really just so rare to have any objects uh, such as these with a firmly established provenance to one of our select few Victoria Cross winners. So Tilson's collection is actually my segue into the final portion of my presentation, uh, the Battle of Hong Kong medal sets of the RCMI. So as a part of the Tilson display, we actually have a text panel with the name of every single Canadian Victoria Cross winner. And by the way, every Canadian VC winner was actually a member of the RCMI. It's a very impressive achievement. So in this, I'd actually like to highlight um, the name of Sergeant Major John Osborne. Osborne, of course, was the lone Canadian VC recipient from the Battle of Hong Kong, where he famously sacrificed himself for his men by throwing his body on top of a live Japanese grenade. I would say next to Osborne's medal set, which is in the collection of the War Museum, perhaps the most notable killed in action Hong Kong set is held and displayed by the RCMI, which is, of course, the medal set of Brigadier J.K. Lawson, the CO, at uh, Hong Kong. So the medals of Brigadier J.K. Lawson, as you see here, uh, really gave you a great snapshot of his long service. Uh, Lawson was actually a distinguished Canadian veteran of both World Wars. You'll notice the service medals from his sets in World War I and World War II. Uh, he actually enlisted originally as a private in the CEF in 1914. He served with the 9th Battalion and with the 1st Motor Machine Gun Brigade during the First World War. Uh, Lawson was actually, during this time, he was actually awarded two mentions in dispatches and a French Croix de Guerre, which you can see at the end of the set. So in World War II, as I mentioned, he commanded the Canadian Sea Force stationed at Hong Kong. And on the 19th of December, 1941, that fateful day, Lawson's Hong Kong headquarters were surrounded by the Japanese army. In an exceptional act of courage, Lawson famously radioed out that he was going outside of his pillbox to fight it out. Brandishing a pistol in each hand, he was killed by Japanese machine gun fire. So following his death, even his enemies displayed great respect to Lawson, who provided him with a funeral with full military honors. As a brigadier, and this is an interesting fact about Lawson, he was actually the highest ranking Canadian officer killed in action during the Second World War. So his memorial cross, as you see on the end with the purple ribbon, is included in this set. Uh, really quick here, we actually dedicated Lawson's medal set in a, in a big medal ceremony on August 21st, 2019. So John Lawson, his son and his family were here to uh, speak on the dedication, as was George McDonnell in the center, back in the corner there of the photo. Uh, and they, this was a very emotional, of course, occurrence. The family spoke. And I'll just highlight one fact from that before I move on, which is George McDonnell's words. And he spoke on behalf of the veterans of Hong Kong being one of the last survivors. And he remarked that he felt at peace knowing that the legacy of his heroic CO was secured at RCMI for posterity. Powerful words. So this brings me to George himself. So just about six months ago in December of 2020, uh, George McDonnell, aged a 98, a Royal Rifles of Canada and a 1941 Battle of Hong Kong veteran, donated his medal group to the RCMI Museum. And I'd like to take a quick note just to thank Mike Babin, our museum staff, our committee, and of course, George himself for facilitating this wonderful acquisition. Uh, George, of course, like many of his comrades, was taken prisoner by the Japanese following the fall of Hong Kong. From December 
26, 1941 to September 1945. George endured and survived imprisonment in camps in Hong Kong, the Chinese mainland, and finally in Ohashi, Japan. Following the Japanese surrender in September 1945, George and 68 other Canadians left the Ohasi POW camp, but would not physically make it home until 1946. The soldiers who fought in Hong Kong, like George, were the first Canadians to see combat in the Second World War and the last to return home. George, who had become a stalwart and inspiring leader to his fellow imprisoned Canadians, told his men upon release, we must not see ourselves as victims. We are victors. We defied our enemies to the best of our abilities until we were ordered to lay down our arms. We have to get on with this life as best we can. George, who is on the call tonight, I say to you again, thank you for your incredible service and for this wonderful donation of your medals, which will form part of our museum's permanent collection. Lastly, and of course, on the woman of the hour, Lieutenant K. Christie. Like George, K. was taken prisoner in December 1941 at the fall of Hong Kong, but she was ultimately released earlier in September 1943 as a part of an agreement negotiated by the Canadian government to release all civilian internees in the Far East. She and May Waters were not civilians, but they were included in this group to be repatriated back to Canada. So despite the efforts of Christie and others captured medical staff, 367 Canadians died in Japanese POW camps before the remaining survivors were liberated after the end of the war. These were really brutal and horrific conditions that they were in. Of course, the Japanese infamously did not sign into the Geneva Convention considerations for prisoners of war and many Canadians uh, unfortunately met horrible ends and those survivors were left with the, and the mental anguish for the rest of their lives. So Kay, really quick here, also holds a great personal significance to the RCMI. She was the first of two female RCMI board members in 1985 and she was a real trailblazer at the RCMI. She sort of kicked in that door of having women more prominent roles at the Institute, which you know, it was an old boys club formed in the 1890s for army officers. So she really helped make these changes and to bring the RCMI into the 20th uh, century. So great, uh, great individual and very much influential on our institution. So I'm not gonna speak too far in Kay's life as uh, our curator emeritus, Greg and Kay's nephew, Bruce will speak further to all of this. Instead, I will showcase some of her objects in the permanent collection of the RCMI as my final point. Uh, as a part of her medal set, which you can actually see here, uh, she was awarded the Royal Red Cross Class II for exceptional services in military nursing. There aren't many of these in existence. Her original medal set and the miniatures, which you can see here, are on display at the RCMI. So lastly, uh, this is actually an amazing artifact and I wanted to end with this. So this is Kay's wartime personal trunk. Uh, it's actually the lar largest type style of army trunk that they had at the time. And this would actually come uh, to her favor later on. So this specific trunk actually has a very interesting and a rather miraculous history. The trunk you see here was in Kay's residence at the Nursing Sisters quarters near Bowen Road in the British Military Hospital in Hong Kong. So after the fall of Hong Kong, the trunk was still in her room, but Kay was able to make one final trip back to the sister's quarters from the hospital where she was to rescue the trunk and its contents before the looters descended on to the hospital. It was a very chaotic time. So the trunk traveled with Kay to the Stanley internment camp where she actually used the trunk as a bed while in captivity, if you can believe this. So upon her release, the trunk went from K with, with K from the Stanley camp to the Japanese ship, the Tetamaru, then on to the SS Gripsum, and finally back to Canada, and eventually to the RCMI in 1994, when it was donated by her nephew, Peter Middleton, shortly after K's death. 
I mentioned as well that Peter also donated the medals at that time. So this trunk is a genuine and exquisite artifact which survived war, internment, world travel, and of course, time. Thanks to Kay and her family, the RCMI now cherishes the finest Kay Christie collection in existence, a collection which would be highly coveted by our national museums. I'll end with saying that, you know, the RCMI has quickly become the premier destination for the Battle of Hong Kong and its artifacts. I would encourage anyone who might be interested in finding a permanent home for their objects to consider the RCMI Museum. As the museum director and the curator of the RCMI, it's been my pleasure to showcase some of our history, our display spaces, our collections, as it relates to the Hong Kong um, collection. I would welcome any of our audience to reach out if you have any further questions or comments. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ryan. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, the, I can speak from personal experience. The RCMI is a wonderful place uh, with fantastic displays and uh, anyone in the Toronto area, you should make a point of uh, uh, arranging to visit the RCMI. It's terrific. Now, let's uh, zero in on Kay Christie. And I invite uh, Greg Loughton to uh, give us his talk on Nursing Sisters Kay Christie and Anna Mae Waters. Gregory, over to you. Hello, good evening. Uh, this is the improved Mark II version given to the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association in fall of 2019. Hope you enjoy it. Kay Christie, born on 10th June 1911 in Little Current on Man Manitoulin Island, Ontario, was schooled in Little Current and Sudbury. In 1925, the family moved to Toronto. Kay attended Riverdale College. From 1927 to 1930, Kay took classes at Shaw Business College and later worked as a stenographer for a brokerage firm. In 1930, Kay began attending classes at Toronto Western Hospital for her diploma in nursing. On 17th February, 1934, she attained her certification as a registered nurse. From 1934 to 1940, Kay worked on staff at Toronto Western, also in private day nursing in Toronto and a crippled children's camp in Collingwood. By 1940, she had 10 years of experience in general nursing and contagious diseases as a student and practicing nurse. In 1940, Kay joined the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps and after training in military law, map reading, security, anti-gas warfare, casualty evacuation and military troop deployment, she obtained her commission as a Lieutenant on 27th November, 1940. Kay wore two brass rank pips on each shoulder strap of her uniform blouse. Remember that Canadian Army Nursing Sisters first deployed overseas in the 1899 to 1902 South Africa War, were the first women in the Commonwealth to be commissioned as officers. During World War II, some 3,656 women joined the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps to work in Canada and overseas. For her first wartime postings, Kay worked at Toronto Military Hospital and Chorley Park Military Hospital. In mid-October 1941, the Army offered Kay a posting, duty in a semi-tropical location with no identification of that location. Despite the mystery and given only five minutes to make up her mind, Kay accepted. On 19th October 1941, Kay embarked on a Vancouver bound train and after a stop in Winnipeg, she met another army nurse, Anna Mae Waters. By discreet cat and mouse questioning, both women guessed that they were traveling to the same mysterious destination. Anna Mae Waters, born 21st January, 1903 in Strathroy, Ontario, moved to Rosedale Avenue, Winnipeg, Manitoba in 1911. She attended Lord Roberts and Kelvin schools. In 1923, she entered Winnipeg General Hospital as a student and graduated as a registered nurse in 1927. From 1927 to 1929, 
Anna cared for tuberculosis patients at Manitoba's Tuberculosis Sanatorium at Nanette, Manitoba. In May 1940, Anna joined the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps and on her commissioning in June 1940, she worked in Winnipeg's Fort Osborne Military Hospital. Later, she volunteered for the same mysterious semi-tropical posting as Kay. On arrival in Vancouver, Kay and Anna reported to Vancouver's military district headquarters. They checked in twice daily at 10 hundred and 16 hundred hours. Staff officers, staff officers advised both women to buy summer clothes. Both women looking for summer clothes in the fall managed to find one summer outfit each. On Tuesday, 27th October, 1941, in Vancouver's Burrard Inlet, Kay and Anna boarded New Zealand-based troop ship HMT Awatia. This is Maori for Eyes of the Dawn. The two women had company, 1,975 men and officers of Sea Force, comprising two Canadian infantry battalions, the Royal Rifles of Canada and the Winnipeg Grenadiers. Escorting armed merchant cruiser HMCS Prince Robert carried a company of Royal Rifles of Canada. A brigade headquarters staff and corps troops, signals, service, medical, dental, ordnance, pay, Provo Corps, chaplain service, also boarded Awatia. Brigadier John Lawson, formerly Canadian Army Director of Military Training, also a veteran of the Great War's Canadian Motor Machine Gun Corps, commanded this group. Passengers often referred to the group as 1,975 plus two. Later in the voyage one evening, as Kay and Anna relaxed in Awatia's lounge, Kay with a drink, Anna with a cigarette, Brigadier Lawson joined them and showed the two lieutenants a letter from the Medical Corps matron in chief, which directed the two women to not drink or smoke in case the men got the wrong idea. Kay and Anna got nothing but attention and respect from the men. Soldiers addressed army nursing sisters as sister or ma'am. On Sunday evening, 2nd November, Brigadier Lawson announced to the officers that Sea Force's destination was Hong Kong and that the increasing international tensions between Japan and the West over continued oil and steel embargoes might result in war breaking out. Sea Force might have to fight its way into Hong Kong. The next morning during a dress parade on Avatia's sunny decks, Brigadier Lawson spoke to the Royal Rifles of Canada and the Winnipeg Grenadiers. Men, it is time to say to you that we are going into a zone of danger, a place of imminent war against odds. The people will be strange to you, the language unknown. Anyone in the place may be an agent of the enemy. Soldiers we must be now and from now on. From here in, what you do enhances or diminishes our peril. We are going to Hong Kong. On Saturday evening, 15th November, a farewell dinner aboard Awatia allowed officers and other ranks some levity, mixing and meeting over a mess hall style four course meal. At a table of 12, Kay and Anna sat with, among others, Major John Crawford, Sea Forces, Senior Medical Officer, and Captain John Reed, second medical officer attached to the Winnipeg Grenadiers. One surviving menu card read in part, Commander, officers, all members of the crew of HMT Awatia extend our best wishes for your future welfare and express to you our Maori land farewell. Kia ora, good luck. Sunday morning, 16th November, the C4 ships Decks lined with cheering Canadian troops entered Hong Kong's inner harbor. The Royal Navy escort vessels, guns clean and gleaming, decks lined with officers and ratings in immaculate summer white uniforms, greeted these new defenders of empire. Circling above at ship funnel level, wings dipped in greeting, droned three 1927 vintage RAF Vickers Wildebeest torpedo bombers. Ashore, Lighting the streets and hillsides, we're cheering Hong Kong civilians. One Hong Kong paper, Telegraph, 
and a special Sunday edition proclaimed, Canadian troops arrive here to reinforce Hong Kong garrison. The men of Sea Force, laden with kit, marched down the gangplanks, formed up, were inspected, and began a two mile march, complete with military bands and Scottish pipers, to Sham Shuipo Camp, white painted concrete barracks shimmering in the heat. Kay and Anna did not march. Matron E. M. Dyson of Bowen Road Military Hospital waited for them. The taxi sped direct to the hospital's sisters' quarters. Kay remembered how proud they were to wear their attractive blue uniforms with the yet well-shined brass buttons. Kay and Anna were the first nursing sisters from the Commonwealth to set foot in Hong Kong. This is a painting done from a photograph of Kay Christie done by the late, late Natalie Gerboji artist in 1994. This is Kay's actual uniform. That afternoon, a general staff officer took Kay and Anna for a sightseeing tour by car. Kay later remembered the officer took great pride in showing us innumerable pillboxes, which he assured us would prevent anyone from landing on the island. And if they did, they would not last for more than five minutes. The next day, Kay and Anna shopped for more summer clothes in Hong Kong. They wore their uniforms only while working. On Tuesday, 18th November, Kay and Anna began work. They found the British Army approach to nursing somewhat dated. Bowen Road Hospital, built in 1907 with a 200 bed capacity, had three floors, each floor with two wings. On the outside of each floor, front and back, was a balcony. Anna re later related, you could not go from one ward to another from inside. You had to use the balcony regardless of the weather. The hospital had no elevator or lift. Anna also observed their way of medicating, doing treatments and dressings was quite different from ours. The matron and a quartermaster began each nursing shift with an inspection of the equipment to ensure that everything was there. Some articles looked as if they had been there since the hospital opened years before. Many of the articles were never used, but still they hung on to them. They just wouldn't change from the new order, from the old order. Kay added a ward had only two enamel basins, one clinical thermometer and four wooden tongue depressors. And the tongue depressors had to be sterilized after each use. On Thursday, 20th November, British Army staff and battalion officers met their Canadian counterparts to discuss the Crown Colony defense plans. The two Canadian battalions began exercises over the rugged hillsides. This was not the garrison duty they expected. The British downplayed Japanese capabilities. British Army intelligence assessment reflected those prejudices, but some Canadians did their own thinking. Captain John Reed, the medical officer attached to the Winnipeg Grenadiers, wrote in his diary, the British and the British, wherever they are, believe they are the best, and the Canadians didn't think so. Before the war, the British talked of the Canadians as colonials, and that's a bad start. Kay recalled Canadian awareness of British tactical inflexibility. One week after our arrival, the senior Canadian officers were present at a meeting outlining the Hong Kong defense plan based on the enemy entering by one certain route. When one Canadian officer asked what the plan was, if the Japanese used a different route, he was assured that they could come as close as planned. Needless to say, the Japanese did not use the route they were expected to use. Kay added later, very early on, it became obvious that the Japanese never intended to, to come by sea. Even I, who knew nothing of the strategy of war, could see that it was more practical and simple to proceed over solid ground in the new territories in the north. On Sunday, 7th December, more diplomatic tensions caused the Hong Kong garrison to fully deploy along the defense lines some 20 hours before the actual attack. However, Hong Kong residents were not alarmed, the general feeling being, pay no mind, the balloon has been going up here for years. The Happy Valley Racecourse, 
the jockey club, the cricket club, the Hong Kong and Peninsula hotels, all enjoyed full houses. The next day, Hong Kong's balloon went up. Streaming across the border came 60,000 soldiers of the Japanese Army's Veterans 38th Division, including combat engineers and small mobile artillery guns deployed right with the infantry. Japanese Army bombers blasted the Wildebeest planes at the mainland's Kai Tak airport into flaming splinters. After five days, the British abandoned their fantastically named Gin Drinkers Lie and the main defensive feature, Shing Mun Redoubt, and retreated back to Hong Kong Island. On Thursday, 11th December, Kay and Anna noted the first artillery shell hit on Bowen Road Hospital. By this time, the hospital was clearly marked with Red Cross insignia, but Bowen Road is in the middle of military targets, a command headquarters, magazine gap munitions depot, a water pumping station, and an anti-aircraft gun. In all, Bowen Road sustained 17 major hits and over 100 smaller hits from splinters and shrapnel bombs. Anna recalled, regular as clockwork, the heavy shelling and bombing would start about 9.25 a.m. until about 11 a.m. with a lull, then a little quieter afternoon, and usually another fairly heavy one around 5 p.m. The top two floors were cleared out. X-ray and operating room equipment went to the basement. All patients who could walk returned to their units. The nurses slept on large mattresses in the hospital basement shelters. Bowen Road Hospital became a casualty clearing station. On Friday, 19th December, Company Sergeant Major John Osborne, A Company Winnipeg Grenadiers, became the first Canadian to win the Victoria Cross in the Second World War. Osborne and his men, surrounded by the Japanese on Mount Butler, threw back enemy hand grenades, and Osborne, in an act of selfless gallantry, threw himself on an enemy grenade to save the lives of seven fellow soldiers. The same day, Brigadier John Lawson, Sea Force Commander, died outside his brigade headquarters post at Wong Nechong Gap. He and six other command staff attempted to escape a Japanese encirclement. Lawson, a pistol in each hand, was cut down with, by machine gun fire. Out of respect for his bravery, the Japanese gave Lawson a military funeral. A Canadian Army chaplain was allowed to remove Lawson's identity bracelet. Bracelet. This remains a prized family heirloom. On Saturday, 20th December, Company Sergeant Major George McDonnell, Royal Rifles of Canada, led a brilliant platoon attack on an enemy artillery battery at Tai Tam Tuck Reservoir. Using the water catchment canals as cover, McDonnell and his men got within 200 yards and in a fusillade of murderous gunfire, wiped out the enemy guns, also Japanese staff officers in a staff car in the wrong place at the wrong time. McDonnell, firing a tracer-loaded Bren gun, covered the retreat of his men with no casualties. On Thursday, 25th December, Kay and Anna, meeting in the matron's office, learned that the Hong Kong garrison had given up. That very morning, they had read in the papers that the situation was well in hand and that a large Chinese army was on the outskirts of Kowloon. That evening, all ranks had a good meal and a last drink of beer, gin, or rum. What remained was poured down the drain. Bowen Road Hospital became prisoner of war camp A. 25th December, 1941, is still referred to in Hong Kong as Black Christmas. Kay and Anna now cared for patients in ever worsening conditions. Hospital windows were all broken, artillery shell holes dotted the roof. In the rainy season, beds had to be continually moved to dry floor areas. The Japanese refused to repair anything. Kay recalled that we finished wards by scrounging, light words for stealing, from any place where there was anything of value. Electricity and gas had been cut off. Anna recalled, we had to sterilize our instruments in our small sterilizer, clean it and use it to boil drinking water for patients 
for light, we had to use lantern. They also boiled water in small kettles on fireplaces in each ward. The Japanese inventoried all medical drugs. Well into 1942, some drugs had disappeared. This is 80-year-old morphine. Other drugs were very limited. Stocks of absorbent wool and gauze dressings became scarce. Kay remembered, before long, we reused old gauze dressings normally discarded, washed and boiled them, and we also reused bandages. Ingenuity and the ability to improvise yet preserve some semblance of surgical technique became a constant challenge. Survival depended on basic nursing knowledge and skills related to cleanliness, sanitation, dysentery treatment. Survival became difficult on the starvation, vitamin reduced diet. Food twice a day for most was eight ounces of rice, four ounces of poor quality flour or dried bread. Four tablespoons of greens or weeds, literally weeds. In January 1942, there was no bread, only military biscuits. For some of the men who had lost their dentures during the battle, these rock hard biscuits offered no sustenance. Diseases associated with general malnutrition and lack of vitamins appeared. Feeding dysentery patients became challenging as they could not eat solid food. For many of the critically ill or dying patients, nurses could only listen to their problems and confessions. Anna's experience in tuberculosis sanatoriums contributed to the survival of prisoners stricken with TB, malaria, and other contagious tropical diseases. All prisoners endured a deliberate daily grind humiliation from the Japanese. Guards walked through wards, demanded watches, jewelry, cameras, steel helmets, flashlights, gas masks. Kay recalled they slashed the gas masks so they would be useless to the Japanese. Every day, prisoners lined up to be counted and checked. Nurses and doctors were to salute and bow to visiting Japanese army officers. Prisoners on the hospital grounds had to bow and salute passing Japanese army staff cars. If they did not, food rations were cut. By January 1942, barbed wire, straight, concertina, and electric circled the hospital. Outside the barbed wire, Japanese army guards routinely bayoneted Chinese civilians. In April 1942, prisoners could send one message card back to relatives. The small card held a 50 word limit, typed or written. This is one of Kay's cards. By October 1942, the International Red Cross had a Hong Kong casualty list. An Australian newspaper also had a published a list of prisoners and Japanese army propaganda broadcasts also gave out names of prisoner survivors. The indirect delivery methods by Red Cross ships and a route through Siberia caused a delay in mail. For many prisoners, the lack of mail was a serious hardship. Kay's father received three short letters from her dated June, July, August, 1942. And Anna got no mail from home, one letter dated May, 1942, until February of 1943. On Monday, 10th August, 1942, Kay and Anna, with other nurses and support staff, were loaded onto trucks like cattle to market and driven to the civilian Stanley internment camp on the south end of Hong Kong. Each person was allowed their personal baggage, three blankets, sheets and pillow slips, cup, knife, fork, spoon, and Kay hung on to an extra hospital dressings basin. Kay, Anna, and a Mrs. Pearl Needham from Vancouver shared a nine by 12 foot room furnished with a small homemade table two chairs, a plank window ledge, a large enamel wash basin. Uncomfortable camp beds were replaced by their storage trunks, which with thin army biscuit mattresses became their beds. Kay's proudest possession was a hot plate made from a five pound sheet steel jam tin wired up by a former electrician 
in return for three cigarettes. Kay didn't smoke, but she hoarded cigarettes as a form of currency. The Japanese did not permit Kay and Anna to do any nursing work at all at Stanley, aside from a week of night duty every month. Both women described the stay at Stanley as uneventful, with hunger, boredom, and idleness the norm. Nuns and former teachers ran school classes, and Kay learned to play bridge. She scored her first grand slam in late July 1943. The food situation by this time had improved slightly with issue of small contents of Red Cross food parcels, tea, sugar, tinned milk and margarine. Anna recalled, we just carried on day by day. We spent many a happy hour in Canada corner and I missed it more than I can say. On 23rd September, 1943, the International Red Cross arranged for Western civilians held in Japanese prison camps to be exchanged for Japanese civilians in North America. The Japanese army likely regarded nursing sisters as civilians, despite their military rank. This curious classification saved Kay and Anna from worsening health. Kay and Anna boarded dirty, crowded Japanese transport ship Tia Maru for a voyage to Portuguese Goa in the Indian Ocean. On 19th October 1943 at Goa, the 1,530 Westerners, 220 of them were Canadian, boarded the very clean Swedish-American liner Gripsholm, fully stocked with food. This is Kay and other internees boarding Gripsholm. Kay is in the middle in the black uh, blouse. Both Kay and Anna wrote up their after action reports for the Canadian army and gained back some weight. Both women recorded their exact gains. Anna 10 pounds, Kay 20 pounds. They caught up with real current news and learned of the new wonder drug penicillin. On 2nd December, 1943, Kay met her father at the Bonaventure railway station in Montreal. She recalled, we were back in Canada where we belonged. Every one of us had a brand new appreciation for a way of life we had previously taken for granted. We Canadians just don't appreciate our freedom and all that it means. Anna returned to Canada a few days later on 6th December, 1943. The Canadian Hong Kong POW experience held lessons for the Japanese. Their runaway Pacific conquests gave the Japanese what they themselves called the victory disease. And some symptoms of this victory disease were contempt and disdain for Western values, horrific treatment of prisoners, certainty that Westerners would not reclaim their lost territory. For the Japanese, surrender meant unendurable shame. For most Westerners, surrender did not mean defeat in the long run. George MacDonnell explained, we maintain strict discipline as an organized military unit, its formal structure and ranks intact, fully operational. Each individual was constantly reminded that he was a Canadian soldier only temporarily under control of the Japanese. This discipline and philosophy saved countless lives and provided concrete support for the survival of many. MacDonnell related the determination and inspiration of Captain John Reed, medical officer with the Winnipeg Grenadiers. With only five weeks of military training and not being a line combat officer, Reed won the respect of the men under his care. Put up with it. We aren't going to lose. It's just a matter of time. These people will never defeat us. The Japanese fatally misjudged British and Commonwealth troops. They, the, the British and Commonwealth troops learned to fight in the jungle and destroyed entire Japanese armies at Imphal and Kohima in Burma. Major Charles Hoey, a Canadian serving with the British in Burma, won a posthumous Victoria Cross on 16th February, 1944. RCAF transport squadrons 435 and 436 flew supply sorties for the British Army in Burma. The motto for the Burma fighters was, when you go home, 
tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. Canadian pilots in the Royal Navy's British Pacific Fleet intercepted kamikaze aircraft off the Japanese coasts. Crews on the Royal Navy aircraft carriers, which had armored flight decks, simply swept the wrecks of crashed planes over the sides. Fleet Air Arm Lieutenant Robert Hampton Gray, DSC, another Canadian, won a posthumous Victoria Cross for sinking a Japanese destroyer off Honshu 9th August, 1945. Kay recovered from her POW experience, returned to civilian life, was struck off the Army's strength, 1st November, 1945. Anna, too, also recovered and served as a nursing sister aboard the hospital ship, the Titia, from September, 1944 to August, 1946, when she also returned to civilian life. A memorial plaque at the Hong Kong Police Academy cites the service of Kay and Anna. For their devotion to duty and their service in the medical corps, both women won the military decoration Royal Red Cross Class II. 170 of these were won by Canadian women in the Second World War. Kay contributed to building a new post-war Canada. She worked as a nurse secretary for a heart specialist then as a medical secretary for a neuropsychiatric specialist, both in Toronto. She was active in the Nursing Sisters Association of Canada, the National Council of Veterans Association, Sir Arthur Pearson Association of War Blinded, Hong Kong Veterans Association, and the Royal Canadian Legion. For many years, Kay could not talk about, our P about her POW experiences, but finally wrote articles on Hong Kong in 1967 and 1979. In the 1990s, she recorded a talk for the CBC series, Voice of the Pioneer. In 1979, Kay joined the Royal Canadian Military Institute. That year, her article, Behind Japanese Barbed Wire, a Canadian nursing sister in Hong Kong, won the RCMI Library's Bolter Award. From 1985 to 1990, Kay was one of the first two women to serve on the RCMI Board of Directors. Kay was one of the first two women to serve on the RCMI Board of Directors, yes. Kay also served on the Functions Committee, which planned and coordinated speakers' events. A former board member and president remembered Kay as always punctual, never late for meetings, always immaculate in dress, giving great attention to her appearance a dignified and decent lady. Diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease in 1992 or 1993, Kay moved to Sunnybrook Hospital. She died on 7th February, 1994. A memorial service at Toronto's Morley Bedford Funeral Home gathered together many of her family relatives, friends, RCMI members and staff. Kay is also remembered by the 1996 Lieutenant Nursing Sister Kay Christie ARRC Memorial Trophy awarded for the X Service Women's Competition at the Canadian National Exhibition Association Warriors Day Parade. From 1946 to 1950, Anna returned briefly to Winnipeg worked at a state sanatorium in Salem, Oregon from 1950 to 1951, and Liahi Hospital in Honolulu in 1952. From 1955 to, 1952 to 1955, she cared for her ailing father in Winnipeg. From 1955 to 1968, Anna cared for patients at Kalau Papa Leprosy Settlement in Molokai, Hawaii. In May 1968, she retired to Long Beach, California. Anna loved to travel, loved nursing, and de dedicated herself to getting her patients well. Anna died earlier than Kay on 8th December, 1987, 46 years to the day the Battle of Hong Kong began. That's my talk. Gregory, thank you very much. That was a detailed, very detailed and fascinating a story of uh, 
Anna Mae Waters and Kay Christie uh, and their role in C4. So thank you very much for that. Now, Bruce. Bruce, as I mentioned earlier, is a nephew of Kay. And uh, Bruce, please give us a few personal recollections of, uh, of Kay. Yes, thank you, Mike. Be happy to do that. And as I said, these are uh, these are personal recollections, uh, really outside and beyond her uh, her military service. Uh, great to be able to have this opportunity on behalf of the Christie and Middleton family. As uh, Gregory stated, uh, Aunt Kay and I'll interchange nursing sister Kay Christie and Aunt Kay, um, being one of her cousins or one of her nephews. She was born in a uh, pretty small town in Northern Ontario called uh, Little Current on Manitoulin Island. And uh, uh, throughout her life, she was a very proud, uh, genuine haw eater, uh, very proud of her, uh, her Manitoulin heritage. I was only four year, five years old. I was in kindergarten when uh, Kay returned from Hong Kong. Uh, but I vaguely remember my parents waking me up one night after bedtime because uh, this lady by the name of Aunt Kay had come to see me and to meet me. And of course she made a big fuss over how big I'd become uh, since she hadn't seen me two years earlier uh, when she got back in 1940. She made a big to-do about what a good looking guy I was gonna be when I got older. So some of these things I guess come true. <laughs> anyway, she was always the flatterer and the joker when it came to her, uh, her nieces and nephews were concerned. In her eyes, uh, we could do no wrong as far as Aunt Kay was concerned. Uh, my younger brother, uh, Brian and I and our cousins were, were all blessed with uh, very supportive and uh, uh, wonderful homes really, where we had frequent uh, family gatherings and uh, Aunt Kay participated in these most enthusiastically. When there was opportunities for Aunt Kay to uh, treat us kids to a, a pop or a milkshake or a juice or whatever, it wasn't just a pop or a juice. It was some mysterious, really grossly mysterious uh, beverage, which she insisted was an absolutely genuine bug juice. Her thing was to give us kids bug juice. It freaked us out and we loved it. It probably wasn't until we were almost in our teens before uh, my brother and cousins and I became somewhat aware of what uh, Second World War military service had entailed for the Christie family. Because in addition to uh, Kay's uh, service overseas in Hong Kong, her uh, younger brother, uh, Jim Christie, served throughout the, uh, throughout the war in the Merchant Marine. Kay's brother-in-law, Harry Middleton, was with the uh, Canadian Army in Europe, mainly in, uh, in Holland and Belgium. And my dad, uh, Ted Christie, was uh, with the Governor General's Horse Guards Reserve. There's a couple of specific details of uh, their, their, there were really very few no specific details of their military uh, uh, service as far as unpleasant wartime uh, uh, things were. As a matter of fact, uh, they just were not divulged to us as, as youngsters. In fact, uh, quite the opposite I would say was true because references to their wartime uh, service were always pretty much glossed over. Uh, in fact, uh, they were almost made out to be uh, fun times that they'd had uh, overseas, whatever that meant. And as little kids, uh, we didn't have a clue about uh, what really must have occurred. But later as, uh, as teenagers in the early 50s, and it gradually became more apparent to us what uh, Aunt Kay might have uh, endured or witnessed uh, in Hong Kong, uh, at that time, she really just spoke to us in very general terms uh, of the meager food rations that have been alluded to, of uh, how male prisoners were made to work uh, beyond the point of exhaustion, and her, her uh, few references to Japanese guards, uh, quite frankly, were not very complimentary or kind, but uh, again, not a lot of specific detail. On her way home from Hong Kong, uh, what must have been on board the, uh, the ship that uh, Gregory mentioned, the, uh, the Gripsum, following the exchange of prisoners at Goa. Uh, Aunt Kay told us how well she was treated by the crew with courtesy and warm fellowship. She described the excellent meals as being necessary to, in her words, uh, fatten her up 
before uh, she dared be seen by her family because of the weight she had lost while in Hong Kong. And uh, Gregory alluded to the fact that uh, she somehow packed on uh, something like 20 pounds in I think six weeks. She also told us uh, how crew members on board ship would often serenade her with songs. And uh, when they picked up on the fact that she had some Irish roots, they would, uh, they would sing over and over again, I'll take you home again, Kathleen. How very fitting is that? She was also told uh, about a brand new hit song in the United States that was composed by Irving Berlin and it was made popular by some fellow by the name of Bing Crosby. And the title of that was, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, just like the ones I used to know. And again, uh, how emotional that must have been having spent uh, the confinement in uh, almost tropical conditions, unpleasant conditions. Years later, while uh, sitting around bonfires uh, at the cottage, uh, having sing songs, Aunt Kay used to laugh about another song serenaded by the crew. And while perhaps it's not all that politically correct today, it was, uh, it was the stuttering, uh, voice impediment stuttering rendition of K -k -k Katie, beautiful Katie, you're the only g -g -g girl that I adore. And when the moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting by the k -k -k kitchen door. And she would sing that, teach us to sing that, and she would laugh. She, uh, she really did have a very keen sense of humor, but she also had a very strong work ethic. She lived well, and she lived well within her means. Uh, Aunt Kay never had a driver's license. She never owned a car. Uh, her preferred cocktail beverage of choice was Canadian rye whiskey. Kay's uh, service and serving on the uh, Royal Canadian Military Institute represented significant personal fulfillment to her in her adult life. You know, I don't recall Aunt Kay being uh, particularly religious However, she referenced a biblical passage from the book of Psalms, Psalm 90, verse 10, which reads, the days of our years are three score and 10, meaning an expected lifespan of 70 years. And she took this literally. So when Aunt Kay reached her 70th birthday, uh, and she was still in quite good health, uh, she rationalized this was uh, uh, the beginning of perhaps borrowed time and the perfect excuse or rationalization to throw a special party. So this she sure did in the form of a, an invitation only uh, live wake. She threw her own wake when she turned 70. Well, uh, I might tell you it was, uh, it was quite a gathering. It was held in her quite small modest apartment. We were jammed in by sardines. She had uh, fellow, uh, uh, fellow veterans, she had uh, entertainment people, people from the media, from the medical field. And uh, it was uh, an opportunity, as she said, to tell uh, wild and crazy stories, reminisce, hoist a few beverages that she had no intention of, of missing. Well, she had this live wake and it was a great success, but we were jammed in like sardines. She was quite the hostess. However, whoever keeps score of this uh, three score and 10 business, uh, Somehow it didn't register with these actuarial numbers. So when she turned 75 and was still in good health, she threw uh, Kay Christie's Live Wake number two. But this time it was hosted in a larger, uh, uh, more comfortable venue. Uh, she rented the entire library lounge of the Roy York Hotel. And uh, this was in June 86, and it was one classy, boisterous party, I can tell you. Lots of her friends. Well, she quit while she was ahead as far as uh, throwing live wakes was concerned. Uh, she didn't throw any more live wakes, but she did. Uh, she was granted uh, another eight years of, uh, of life before finally passing away, as Gregory mentioned, from uh, this terrible ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. This was in Sunnybrook Hospital's uh, Veterans K Wing. Even then, Aunt Kay never really lost her sense of humor. Even when she could no longer speak or, or vocalize, verbalize, she would still give a written response to visitors' questions, quite often with a typical Aunt Kay lighthearted quip. 
And I want to leave with just one other uh, memory that I have with Aunt Kay that, uh, that has stuck with me. She always, always, always referred to her, her fellow Hong Kong veterans as her boys. These were guys uh, getting up in years, but to Kay, they were still her boys. And uh, I can tell you, she loved these guys. And it was pretty apparent to, uh, to us that they loved her in return. And I really respect the opportunity to share these memories with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's uh, wonderful that you were able to share these personal memories of, of Kate Christie with all of us. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. So now we're, we're ready to take your questions, uh, members of the audience. So uh, you can please submit them now. Use the question and answer icon at the bottom of your screen. Remember, you may have to touch the screen or move your mouse in order to get it to show up. Now to your questions, we have a few of them here. Um, first of all, uh, Greg, uh, this one is for you. I think you said at the outset, but maybe you could repeat, where did Kay Christie get her medical training in Canada? A question from, from David. And you'll have to turn on your microphone. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Toronto Western Hospital. Toronto Western Hospital, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, and Andrea is asking, why did they only send two nurses? Probably one for each battalion. Or, yeah, one for each battalion or regiment, but battalion, yes. Yeah, it's interesting. There were, there were two nurses, but four doctors. Uh, probably the reverse of the usual, usual ratio. Um, Janet wants to know, did Kay and uh, Anna May, Anna May re remain in contact? Uh, after 1943? I don't know that. Okay. Um, I think they had one meeting. Ah. If I may interrupt, I understood they, they did get together once. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Um, David wants to know, was Kay ever recognized by the Canadian government for her service during World War II? Uh, you did mention, Greg and Ryan both, the, uh, the medal which she received, the red medal. Uh, there was that. Maybe you could remind me of the name of that decoration. The Royal Red Cross Class II. Okay. And in some of the core, well, maybe Bruce, you can uh, mention about the uh, pension situation. Yes, I'll try. Kay, uh, Kay was an advocate of of her boys, as uh, they were referred to, uh, and endeavored to lobby for uh, improvements to their pensions. Uh, many of these uh, gentlemen were, uh, were, I guess, passing away prematurely, perhaps because of the, uh, the malnutrition, the uh, diseases they and the abuse that they had uh, received. So she felt that their pensions were definitely undervalued. And uh, I know that she uh, collaborated with, uh, I believe, the Minister of Veterans Affairs at the time, a Mr. George Hees, and uh, traveled with him and worked closely with him to endeavor to uh, gain some improvement on the status of these pensions. That's about all I can add. Okay, thank you. Uh, Muriel has asked, uh, were either of them married? They did not marry. And I don't believe Anna did either. Okay, I think we have no other questions. We do have, and we'll take this offline, but we do have someone who's offering uh, to uh, donate an artifact to, uh, to the RCMI. So we'll be in touch about that afterwards. All right, I think that's all of the questions for tonight. So I'd like to, to thank uh, you, Ryan, Gregory, and Bruce uh, for your presentations this evening. They were beautifully prepared and well presented. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone in the audience for joining us tonight. I'd like to especially thank the staff and the volunteers of the Royal Canadian Military Institute for their hard work to make this event a success. So everybody, please enjoy your summer and I look forward to having you join us for again for our next series of virtual events in the fall. Thank you and good evening. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. 
On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.